Christian Ministries presents Start Our Sabbath. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. As always, we'll have lively Bible topics and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. Good evening and welcome to our 66, not 666, right? But our 60. Someday we'll get to 666. Won't yeah, we? God willing. Yeah. All right, welcome to our 66th episode of Start Our Sabbath, the show where we love bringing on the Sabbath with all of you out there in internet land. The Seventh day Sabbath is such a wonderful gift from God, and we're so blessed to celebrate this gift week after week after week. That's right, and please remember that no animals were injured during the taping of the show. Also remember that there were no stunt doubles during the show. Wes and I do all our own stunts on the show. Now that we've begun the show with our usual usual irreverence, people are going to write all kinds of letters and emails to us over And that's show. okay. We do this to show you that we never take ourselves seriously. We take our religion seriously, but not ourselves. And we hope that you had a good week. As always, Nancy and I know what a lot of you are facing out there because we see you on Facebook where, uh, you know, just about everybody's guilty of TMI. On Facebook at one time or another. TMI? Yeah, too much information. Ah. Yeah. All right, and we don't mind TMI because we like knowing what's going on in your lives, and that's why we encourage you to talk to us in the chat room. I mean, why do you think I have all these devices? That's right. And, you know, I really like Facebook for a lot of reasons. If nothing else, Facebook is our main way of reaching people with SOS. These days, SOS gets anywhere from 1,800 to, like, 2,100 hits a week on Facebook, and that doesn't even include YouTube. And we don't do any paid advertising. No, we do not. So we love Facebook mm -hmm. for that reason. But I have a feeling Wes's comments about Facebook are leading up to something that's bad, or at least I'm not going to like. Yeah, you know me too well. Let's talk about likes on Facebook. Okay, let's. what about likes on Facebook? Well, whenever I see something that's really good on Facebook, especially when it falls under Philippians 4.8, I like to hit the like button. Sure. Philippians 4 8 talks about how we should think about whatever's true, noble, right, pure, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. And I notice you're always hitting the like button when uh, there's positive things like that on Facebook. Positive things. That's right. But when some grumpy old guy starts complaining on Facebook about something that he's mad about, I don't I don't like those. All right. And you're always saying you wish they had a dislike button for the negative Facebook. That's posts. right. Because they don't have a dislike button, only a like button. So here's my solution. I'm going to set up a fake Facebook account and say that my name is nobody. What? Why in the world would you set up a face, fake Facebook account <laughs> under the name of nobody? Well, right now when I hit the like button for something on Facebook, it shows up on the other person's page as Wes likes your post. Sure, yeah, it does. But if I have a Facebook account where my name is nobody, then when I hit the like button for some something that some grumpy old man posts, it'll show up on his on his page as nobody likes this. <laughs> Get it? Where do you come up with this stuff? I think this would be a great idea. Can we move on from this? Nobody's stopping you. Hey, that's my line. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, once again, we want to give a big thank you to Carl Noctree in North Carolina. And his sidekick, maybe we have a picture of them. Oh, yes, uh, we do, yes. Mimi in Canada for their work on the show every Friday evening. They connect our Facebook feed to YouTube, and we hope that someday we're going to get a Roku set up. Yes, Carl's a computer genius, and he not only uh, does our Facebook uh, our, our um, Facebook connection, but he also does the DCM website, and he does the RLDEA website. And he uh, produced the first um, 21st Century Thinker, which right. came out Carrie really, Nation. really good mm -hmm. Car on Carrie Nation. Carl is a computer genius, but I have a question. Can he connect Facebook to Roku? We hope to find out. Because we want to get a Roku channel set up eventually. Also, we've got another computer genius helping us out in California. Terry Lucenheide, 
Bill's Better Half, connect Bill's feed to us every Friday evening so we can have him on the show and the better looking half. Yeah, she's much better looking. Yeah, <laughs> We really do have some awesome people helping out with all this stuff every Friday night. And we hope we've got a great show laid out for all of you. Yeah, tonight Nancy is going to talk about praising God. I am. Bill's going to talk about myths. How to destroy those myths. And I'm going to talk about what was actually nailed to the cross. What was nailed to the cross during the crucifixion. And the answer may surprise you. All right. Well, let's open with prayer. Let's do that. Our Father, and if you'll bow your heads, please. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for the love that is here tonight with all of your people around the world who are being obedient to you and following your Sabbath day. Father, we thank you so much that uh, you have love for us. You gave us Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, to save us from uh, eternal death so that we may live eternally with you. That is a wonderful gift, and we thank you so much for it. Now, Father, please be with us. Help your love to be with all of uh, those who are participating in the show tonight. Help us to do a good job of obeying you and letting our light shine so that we might glorify you. So we commit this show to you. We give you praise and thanks, and we do it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right, well, we've got some follow-up on two of our shows. First, mm -hmm. um, it's a follow-up of SOS number 62, where we talked about the changing demographics in the U.S., it was called the Browning of America. We mentioned how in the states, and now in the many states, Hispanics outnumber Anglos. Here's an interesting statistic that came from Pew Research. Hispanics make up 17.8%, almost 18% of the U.S. population, but they account for almost half of the annual growth of the U.S. population. They have lots of babies. Yeah, lots of babies. Yep. Second is a follow-up on SOS number 65, where we announced that the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association is now in full gear and operating. And if you're interested in seeing what the RLDEA is all about, please check out our website, rldea.com. Now, back to this demographic phenomenon regarding the browning of America. We, uh, as we've said, Wes and I find this very interesting. Now, this demographic shift that's on, on us right now has been on us really for years. None of it has been kept secret. So when something like this is happening <coughs> in society, we're always thinking, how can we meet the change, the challenge of this phenomenon? What can we do to improve what we're doing in the area of preaching the gospel? Yeah. Now, a few years ago when I was over at CEM helping Allie, sometimes she would, uh, she and I would go out to lunch and we'd talk about ideas, just brainstorming. And Allie always liked to brainstorm on how to better promote Ron, Ron's works. And one of the ideas that Allie and I discussed was to translate Ron's books into Spanish. I mean, if we've got a bunch of Spanish speakers living here in the United States, why not translate Ron's books so that they can read them? And man, did we get flack for that idea. And here was the main objection that we got. A lot of people said, if these people want to read Ron's books, then they should learn English. It's their job to learn English. It's not our job to translate things into Spanish for them. Now, let's be clear that I have no desire to get into the debate about whether or not we should make things easier in America for those who don't speak English. I don't get into that debate. And I know a lot of people out there are offended with all the work that they have to do when they're forced to press one on their phones, you know, for English. Because if you add up all the times you press one for English in your lifetime, that's quite an accumulation of work. Sarcasm? Okay, so I'm not part of that debate. And in all actuality, when you call some businesses that make you press one for English, most of the time those businesses are doing this English-Spanish choice on the phone because it's to their advantage. They're not doing it because they've been forced to by the government or forced to by some group demonstrating outside their corporate offices. They're doing it because they want to capture the business of the people who speak Spanish. They're doing it because it helps them make money. So again, I'm not part of that debate. My concern is preaching the gospel. And if I personally believe that translating our publications into Swahili or French or Russian or Spanish is what it's going to do to make disciples of Jesus. I'm all for going to go ahead with those translations. So anyway, that's just a little historical footnote 
that I thought you might find interesting uh, regarding Ron's uh, publications. All right. Okay. So um, on SOS 63, we talked about how the church needs to do a better job of reaching young people. In fact, all three of us had that as our subject for that night. Yeah. And tonight we thought we'd mention a church publication that we believe is helpful to young people who are seeking God. That's right. The July-August 2018 issue of the Bible Advocate has several good articles that can be helpful to young people. One of them was an article written by Robert Coulter entitled Changing Concepts. Brother Coulter talks about how the Church God Seventh Day has had to change its teachings over the decades. For example, in the early days, now you're going to love this. In the early days of Church God Seventh Day, the use of tobacco was not forbidden. In fact, one of their founding ministers was a guy named Gilbert Cramner who regularly chewed tobacco during sermons. And while he was preaching, he would spit tobacco between sentences. Well, as time went on, Church God Seventh Day changed its position on tobacco products and now preaches against their usage. And I welcome that. That's great. Church God Seventh Day has also gone through some changes when it comes to things like women's dress, uh, things like divorce and remarriage. And I think this issue of the Bible Advocate shows the importance of growing in grace and knowledge in our walk with Christ. As we study the Bible, we must constantly be proving and reproving what we believe. And that shouldn't bother us because if I prove something to be the truth from the Bible in 1971, I shouldn't mind having to prove it again today. So I think this issue of the Bible Advocate has some interesting topics that can be beneficial to young people in their struggle to understand the Bible and learn God's ways. All okay. Right. Do you want me to do a little chat room stuff before I get started? Uh, no, go ahead and do that. We'll come to the chat room later. Go ahead and start your segment if you if we wouldn't mind. I don't mind at all. Oh, yes. I'm a big fan of the movie A Knight's Tale starring Heath Ledger. Ledger plays a commoner named William who poses as a knight by the name of Ulrich von Lichtenstein. You need your wheel. That's a good German name. Yeah. Yep. And we, get, we like Germans on this show. This film has action, some kicking music, the underdog wins in the end, the, it has romance, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back, so what's not to love? One of the funniest scenes is, is the introduction, and funny to me anyway, of the knights before a jousting match. Now, as part of my Toastmasters training, I understand there's a fine art to introductions. You have to learn something about the person you're introducing and help the audience to understand why they should be interested in what the speaker has to say. But introductions in A Knight's Tale seem to be intended to do three things. Stir up the support of the crowd, strike some fear into the opponent, and praise a knight's accomplishments. Recently, I caught a snippet of the movie while I was flipping through the channels, and this snippet happened to be the most braggadocio introduction of the bunch. As the character of Henry Chaucer rounded out clearly false claims of the knight's piety, honor, and military success, he concluded with, I give you the one, the only, the Sir Ulrich von Lichtenstein. And the crowd went wild. You know, praise for humans is best when direct and honest. I'm not one to say you need to be miserly with your praise of your children or your mate, as some people believe, because I believe it's okay to be lavish in praise. But I know that praise that's not based in reality can ultimately be utterly worthless. The thing about God is that there are no praise-filled superlatives that aren't based in reality when it comes to him. When praising God, we use terms like eternal, all-knowing, savior, king, font of all wisdom, creator of all, possessor of the universe, master of all creatures, great and small, all-powerful, lawgiver, soft, so, source of all good gifts, and so much more. That's celestial. Now let's turn back to the terrestrial. In my opinion, Society suffers from the overuse of the word awesome. It's overused to the point where when you tell someone you did an awesome job on dinner, it loses its value because a movie, a book, tying your shoe, losing some weight, and a beautiful sunset all get tagged with awesome. The word awesome is an adjective that means extremely impressive or daunting, inspiring great admiration, apprehension, or fear. But it has lost its value in our society, in my opinion, because of its overuse. But our God is an awesome God, just as the word was intended to be used. He's extremely impressive, inspires great admiration, and sometimes fear. If we know him at all, we should commend, it should commend our respect, his accomplishments, his sacrifices for us, his power, his plan of salvation, his love for us, 
his crafting of the universe from giant suns to tiny particles, and the mighty miracles we read in the word or see in our lives should lead us, lead us to great admiration of the one true God. We are told to praise him. Psalm 99 verse 9 says, Exalt the Lord your God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Psalm 135 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, you servants of the Lord. The entirety of Psalm 148 is a call for man and nature to praise God, and it finishes with these verses, verse 13 and 14. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Perhaps, like me, you've been taught that the Lord's Prayer of Luke 11, verses 1 through 4, is an outline for how we should pray. In verse 2, Jesus tells us to begin with, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It says, begin with praise. However, just like I don't allow the very cryptic, give us this day our daily bread in verse 3, to restrain me from asking for every blessing or request I feel my, uh, myself, my acquaintances, my family, or my friends need from stress to, re to healing, to wisdom, to forgiveness, to a happy marriage, I should not let the simple hallowed be thy name commandment cause me to gloss over the instructions to praise him. So I have to ask myself, am I miserly with my praise of the real one and only? You know, God is no commoner seeking greatness. He is great, and yet he chooses to be near to us commoners, as we find in Deuteronomy 4 verse 7, where I'm quoting, For what great nation is there that has a God so near as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? So maybe I could take my cues from Chaucer's introduction of Sir Ulrich, and while I'm at it, I might as well say it out loud. If you want to join me in the future or tonight, you can recite something like the following out loud at the top of your lungs as if to a massive crowd of listeners who are hanging on to your every word. Our God is awesome. He's great and greatly to be praised. The heavens are his throne. The earth is his footstool. He made the earth, which is our home, the sun, which gives us warmth, the moon, with light, which lights our way at night, and the stars that gladden the night sky and which have been guiding travelers since time began. These stars, which cannot be counted, he knows by name. He made every atom and molecule that comprise the intricate and tightly engineered composition of life. He created our intricately and delicately balanced DNA molecules that make up who we are from how we function to the color of our hair and eyes. God formed the beasts of the earth and gave each one the coverings they needed from the tough and wrinkled skin of the elephants to the delicate graceful wings of the butterflies. He is the source of wisdom and strength. He, his love is abundant. His mercy is everlasting. His wisdom is sure and can be relied on to guide us every day. He inspires hope in the hopeless and breaks every chain that would enslave us. His power and might know no bounds. He inhabits eternity. He inhabits the most humble servant who is willing to trust in him. I give you the one, the only, the almighty, the eternal loving God who, in whom there is no equal and the crowd goes wild. In the words of the psalmist in Psalm 48, verse 1, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, his holy mountain. And I will praise him with abandon. Will you join me? I welcome your thoughts and comments and questions. And you can write me at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org or in the chat room this evening. Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, you, you're going to have to learn how to express yourself just a little bit more. Quit okay? stifling my emotions. Yeah, quit stifling your emotions. Tell us how you really feel. Go get Bill while you're uh, <laughs> while you're calming while yourself I'm down. My, okay. My okay. Uh, while you're stifling stifling your emotions. Okay. Uh, we want to remind you one more time that uh, you should check out the Facebook page Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. It's awesome. It's wonderful. No, nope, I can't say awesome. It's wonderful. It's terrific. It has over eighteen thousand followers. We suggest you check it out. It's run by our friend Bill Lucenhide, who Nancy is connecting on the show right now. And uh, hopefully he's going to uh, show up so I can quit talking and let Bill take over. Um, also, I want to remind you um, that we never ask. We, if you send us money, we're going to send it back. That's just our policy. Don't want your money. But we do want your prayers 
and we do want you to hit the share button. So if you get any value out of the show tonight, please hit the share button because we want to want you to share it with other people. If you like the show, other people might just like it too. Hey, Bill, are you there? Hey, I'm here. Thank you, Wes. Great to How be are you doing tonight, brother? Uh, it's so nice to see you. Yes, good to be with you here at our West Coast studios, broadcasting to you live, live with 50,000 watts of power permeating <laughs> every cell of your body with the very best of Sabbath information and relevant information for this very special group, Sabbath Observing Christians. It's certainly my yep. pleasure to be with you. Yeah, 50,000 watts. You sound like you're on AM radio, Bill, doing <laughs> one of your finance shows. Well, I hope, I hope that uh, my fidelity is a little better than AM radio, which once ruled the airwaves. Wes, when did America go down? It was when FM radio took off. It was <laughs> AM radio ruled we were at our top. So That's right, when we were in diapers. What do you got for us tonight, Bill? Well, listen, again, thank you very much for having me on the show. And okay. I'd like to... Uh, talk about a little bit about a show that I enjoy uh, a lot called Mythbusters. I've been watching that for many years. Perhaps you've seen it too. And on the show, the hosts and their staff explore different myths and urban legends that permeate society. And then they apply scientific method to prove them whether they're true or not. It's very enjoyable. Now today on this program, I'm going to explore a popular myth that I found that still continues to resonate in some of the pockets of our church culture. In fact, it was just a couple of days ago, I heard this propagated by a church leader. And the concept is this, that the sign of the true church, or we'll call it the Philadelphian era church, is a growth rate of 30% per year. Now, funny enough, the program that you're watching here tonight, Start Our Sabbath, we have grown 300% in the last year alone. Thank you very much for all of you that share the page and, and have told your friends and the like, but we have grown not just 30%, but 300% in one year. The Facebook page, Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers that I manage, has grown at 109% a year for over the last five years. And listen, we're thankful for the blessing and we're thankful for God's uh, uh, intervention in helping to make those a success. But does that make Starter Sabbath or Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers the location of the true church somehow? Or does that make Wes, Nancy, or myself some kind of guru leaders, something more special to God, uh, somebody you should send money to? God forbid, absolutely, it does not. It does not indicate anything. Yes, we've been blessed, but it doesn't indicate that we are somehow the focal point of God and uh, you should focus all your attention on us. But I'm going to establish for you that the idea of 30% compounded a year is just not possible for any multiple generational sustainability. It can be achieved for very short periods of time and starting with very small amounts, which we did. We started with very small amounts of people for Start Our Sabbath. We started with very small amounts of people for Seventh-day Sabbath Keepers, and it has grown. With, again, we're thankful for that. But let me demonstrate this from using an old story of the widow's might, and that's found in Mark 12. And if you remember, the old lady, the old widow lady comes and puts two copper coins, we'll call them pennies for a sake of argument, into the offering. Now here's what's amazing. If that widow's might of just two cents were compounded at a rate of return of just 1% a year, the total today, after 2,000 plus years, would be more than Ten million dollars. That's amazing. But listen to this. It's the power of compounding. If she could have just made two percent a year on those two pennies, if the church would have took those two pennies and, and multiplied it at just two percent a year over the last two thousand years, those two cents would have grown into now listen to this three thousand one hundred and seventy two trillion dollars. Yes, and I checked the math on that on my financial calculator several times. $3,172 trillion. Did you know that's more than the, all the wealth of the entire world? Actually, many times over. In, um, I'll give you another example that's interesting. In 1626, the Native Americans sold Manhattan to the Dutch for about $24 worth of beads and trinkets. Now, if 
the Native Americans had just invested their money in corporate bonds. We'll pretend there was a bond market in those days. Actually, there was some in Europe. And it yielded 6% a year. That value would be $2.8 trillion today. That's worth more than all men had today, including the buildings. So I don't know who made the better deal. Maybe the, uh, the Indians made the better deal. And if they would have invested in a theoretical stock market made just 10% a year, that investment would be worth $1,000 trillion. Again, many times greater than the wealth of the entire world, all of the assets, the land, the oil, everything. So the problem was not the deal that the Native Americans made. Rather, they hired the wrong investment advisor. <laughs> Make sure that you hire the right investment advisor. And actually, Bo, these things do show one thing. And that is this, in the cycle of life, there are major cycles of destruction that reduce the gain back to zero. Sort of like a jubilee or a reset. And even though we don't celebrate the jubilee and, and the like, economics, the nature of things itself, restores things back to a zero sum, reversion to the mean. I theorize that about once every hundred years or so, there's war or destruction or political change. Uh, if you'd lived in Atlanta, Georgia during the Civil War, and Sherman marched to the sea, this is in the United States, just 150 years ago, you would have lost everything. You would have been burned to the ground. Economic changes, et cetera. They reduce you to zero again. Now, I'm president of an investment advisory firm, and I tell this to clients often. And it's important to remember this. Trust not always in your wealth, because the greatest wealth that you have, both temporal and spiritual, the most, te most permanent thing you will ever get in this life is what you develop here, the character, the spiritual knowledge, the wisdom. That is the true wealth, and never forget that. Okay, another thought. Let's move in a different direction here. The Armstrong movement, going way back to 1933, started with 19 people. And today the fruit, we'll call it a combination of all the successor movements, all the independents, all those that can kind of trace their lineage back to the uh, Worldwide Church of God, is around 25,000 people. And again, using my trusted financial calculator, that worked out to be an 8.82% rate of return since 1934. That's not 30% a year. And that's in a range of what the stock market has returned, which has been close to 10% since a year since 1933. Certainly not. 30% a year, and in fact, even below corporate returns. Frankly, let me editorialize here. The big shakeout back in 1995 in several organizations was kind of a correction of an overbought bubble that was impossible to maintain. But let's be honest, the church had become bloated. It was untested, and it was full of many, many tares and non-believers. Again, 30% a year is not possible for any multiple generational sustainability for any type of human organization. Now let's take a look at some of uh, our other Sabbath keeping groups. Church of God, Seventh Day. And there's some early pioneers from the early Advent movement. There's Ellen G. White, there's William Miller, and some others. In looking at the Church of God, Seventh Day, they had a group of five pioneering members in 1860. Today, the Church of God Seventh Day is about 200,000 people around the world. And if you do the math, that's a very sustainable 6.94% year growth rate. So small growth rates over time can really mean some really large numbers. Uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church, after the great disappointment of 1844 following the uh, Miller movement, there was about 1,000 people in the Advent movement. In the Seventh day Adventist Church, uh, NASA Seventh day Adventist Church. Today, that 1,000 has grown to 17 million people globally. That sounds impressive. That sounds like that'd be a real high rate of return per year. But you know what? That's just a growth rate of 5.76% a year after 174 years. Again, a very sustainable long term growth rate. So, listen, let's go to the Bible. What does it have to say about 30% growth rates? Is that the sign that God has said you got to have? And I did an exhaustive search of the Bible to find the words 30% annual growth rate or finding that as a standard. 
Well, needless to say, I found none. However, we do find an interesting story about David back in 1 Chronicles 21, with David wrongly conducting a census and counting of the people, which was against God's will. When I first heard of that 40-plus uh, years ago, I wondered, well, what was wrong with that? What was wrong with David wanting to take a count? And it brought God's wrath upon Israel. And I'll theorize this, and I think it's, it's a reasonable assumption. David wanted to have faith in numbers rather than have faith in God. Is God measuring the church today by human metrics? It's a good question to ask. Is he measuring us by how much income our group is generating? Is he measuring our success by how many magazines we put out or how many letters or how many booklets are sent out at what growth rate? Is this the sign of God's presence and his blessings? Now, Matthew 23, verse 23, speaks of, of some numbers. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. All right? Yet you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Skipping over to 1 Corinthians 13 at the end there. And now abideth in faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So is there a way, is there a way for our church organizations to measure these important things? To measure justice, mercy, faith, hope, and love? Is there a barometer? Is there a thermometer? Is there some sort of way we can measure it? No, there's not. There's no way to measure these things carnally or to think on these things numerically. And I think that that frustrates some people. So what they end up doing is they end up looking to the earthly things to try to do so, to try to claim some sort of mantle of God or mantle of the movement, right? Because we've grown magazines by 20% or 30%. Well, listen. If we want to raise some sort of a bar of achievement and to use this as God's presence, then let all of us strive for a 30% annual growth rate on the things that really do matter to him. And I'll say it again, and I want you to remember this. These are the things that matter to God. These are the things that we should be growing at a compounded annual growth rate. Justice, mercy, faith, hope, and love. My best to all of you. Very good. Thank you, Bill. We really appreciate that. Thank you, Wes, and blessings to you all. Okay, and you have a good Sabbath. Right. Say hi to Terry for us. All right, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Okay, very good, Bill. I think we're, uh, let's see, Nancy's not here, so we won't do the chat room. Uh, she'll be back, and we'll get into it shortly. Let's go into our third segment. Uh, let's see, where are we? Are you ready for the third segment? This is the one we're going to talk about, nailing things to the cross. The Rorschach test is a psychological examination where the study or the subject of the examination looks at a series of ink blots and then he gives his impressions of the images. Psychologists use this test to examine a person's personality characteristics and his emotional functioning. It's also called the ink blot test. This is made from ink blots. If I were to ask one of you to tell me what's in this picture on the screen, you might tell me you see a bat. Another person might see two women facing each other. A third might see a lobster. Or someone with problems might see his mother trying to beat him with a baseball bat. On and on we could go with many interpretations of the picture. What we see in a picture like this so many times is a reflection of our way of thinking, and too many times what we see is a reflection of what we want to see. We could perform the same exercise with pictures of famous people. If I were to put a picture of Donald Trump up here, many people would say, oh, I see a wonderful person. But many others would be far less complimentary. If I were to put a picture of Barack Obama up here, the exact same thing would happen. Again, what we get out of a picture so many times is what we want to see. And too many times, our understanding of the world is not reality. Instead, it's a reflection of what we want the world to be. And this happens in the Bible all the time, doesn't it? For example, when we read Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, what comes to your mind? Let's read it here. Paul writes, verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And here's where Bible translators insert themselves into the act of translation. One of the reasons that we have to look at different translations of the Bible when trying to understand the Word of God is because these folks who have provided us with these translations have let their personal biases get in the way of their translations. They do their own Rorschach thing on certain verses, and they do this by inserting their personal biases into their translations. And here's a couple of examples of translations of Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Here is where guys who translated these versions clearly let their biases affect them. Let me explain. The International, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the International Bible Society created a translation of the Bible. Colossians 2.14 in their version called the New International Reader's Version of the Bible goes like this. He wiped out the written law with its rules. Continuing on, their translation says, the law was against us, it opposed us, so therefore he, meaning Jesus, took away the law and nailed it to the cross. That's one example. Samuel Henry Cook was an English scholar. He was a loyal member of the Church of England, or we call it the Anglican Church. The Church of England in the United States is called the Episcopalian Church. Well, Hook came up with a translation of the Bible, and in Hook's translation, here's how he put Colossians 2.14. It reads like this. Having put an end to the handwriting of the law, which was against us, taking it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. So, if you believe that these two translations that I just read are correct, then you have to believe that the law of God was nailed to the cross. In other words, these two translations of the Bible clearly say that the Ten Commandments are no longer in force in the post-crucifixion world. But then we look at other translations and we get an entirely different picture of Colossians 2.14. Here's just one example. Here's what the Catholic Church says about this verse of the publication. Mysteries of the Rosa, uh, uh, Rosary, the, in their publication, says it should go like this. He has wiped out the record of our debt to the law, which stood against us. What stood against us? Not the law, but the debt. Our, he has wiped out our record of the debt to the law, which stood against us. He has destroyed it by nailing it meaning the debt, to the cross. This is amazing. Two things. First of all, there's a vast difference from these, uh, this is a, a, a vast difference from the first tr translations that we read. They're night and day. And second, notice that even the Catholic Church does not say that Colossians 2.14 does away with God's law. Catholicism very clearly differentiates between the debt of the law and the law itself. And in two weeks, I want to look more at what the Catholics say about the law being done away with, because I received something interesting from a former Sabbath keeper who has now embraced Catholicism, and he sent it to me, and I think it's going to be, uh, you're going to find it interesting. And I'm not going to mention the guy's name because I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to embarrass him. Again, that's going to be two weeks from tonight. We can't do it next week because we're going to have special guests on the show. We'll talk about that later. The point is this. This scripture, Colossians 2.14, is a Rorschach test. The guys who translated the first two verses that we read obviously inserted what they wanted to believe into their translation, and the Catholics, on the other hand, believe it or not, got it right on this verse. Now, let's make a really important clarification here. I hope you can read what's, what's on the screen. If you're watching from your iPhone and you can't read it, here's what it says. Let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am being persecuted whenever I'm being contradicted. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that. One of the most annoying conversations I can have with a person is when he says that some church is either all good or all bad. Or when he says that some minister is either all good or all bad. Or when he says some person in history is either all good or all bad. When we make statements like that, we are oversimplifying 
because no person or no church is either totally and completely good or totally and completely bad. So sometimes when I take exception to a doctrine of the Catholic Church, someone will say, oh, you're bashing the Catholic Church, and I'm not. I don't bash the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church does some wonderful things like setting up hospitals and charities for the poor. I admire the Catholic Church for their good works. On the other hand, the Catholic Church has some doctrines that I don't agree with. And when I disagree with one of those doctrines, it's not because I hate the Catholic Church or because I think the Catholic Church is bad or because I like the Catholic, I like to bash the Catholic Church. Again, that's an oversimplification. And, and oversimplifications are so problematic. And this type of oversimplification, oversimplification is especially problematic because it requires a judgment on my part, a judgment that I'm not willing to make. Because I'm not in the business of making an overall judgment on a church or on a person. That's the job for Jesus. So if I disagree with some particular doctrine of your church, whether it's the Catholic church or a Sabbath-keeping church, it's absurd for you to conclude that I hate your church or that I'm a basher of your church. I'm not hating or bashing your church. I'm just disagreeing with a doctrine of your church. And I'm, I'm amazed because I ask myself, why is this so hard for Christians to understand? Why is it that when there's some type of disagreement, it has to be followed by anger? Why is it that when there's some type of disagreement, someone has to take it so personally? Disagreement is not persecution. It's just disagreement about a specific point. Unfortunately, when a disagreement is brought up, it's at this point when incivility gets introduced into the conversation. And again, it's because a person feels that he or his church are being persecuted, and then that's when the ugliness starts. If I teach something and someone disagrees with me, I try to respond with, okay, no problem. And, and when I respond with no problem, I'm not being flippant. I'm not saying, well, I don't care what you think. You're nothing to me. No, no, I do care what you think. I'm not diminishing your worth because as a Christian, I'm obligated to esteem others as better than myself. So when I say no problem, I'm only saying it's natural that we all can't agree on everything. All of us are not going to agree on everything, well, until Jesus returns. When Jesus returns, he'll reveal perfect truth and perfect knowledge. Until then, Quit getting your panties in a wad when someone disagrees with something that you believe or when someone disagrees with something your church teaches or when someone disagrees with something that the late founder of your church teaches. Quit taking it so personally. All right, let's move on. Let's continue. As Christians, we really, really need to understand Colossians 2.14. We really, really need to understand what it was that was nailed to the cross because this scripture, Colossians 2.14, ties in with whether or not a Christian needs to keep the Ten Commandments. So let's examine and understand what Paul is saying when he talks about nailing things to the cross. Now, I'm sure that we can agree that there were indeed certain things nailed to the cross. Can can we at least agree on that point? Let's see if we can come up with a list of things that were nailed to the cross, because I'm telling you that there was more than one, just one thing nailed to the cross. So let's make a list. First, Jesus was nailed to the cross. Can't we agree on that? Isn't this a no-brainer? Now, we're not all going to agree on how Jesus was nailed to the cross. I get that. There are those who point to experiments that have been done on cadavers, and these experiments have shown that if you nail a person up by putting nails in his hands, hold him up, there's not enough flesh and bone and muscle to hold that weight. These experiments show that within a matter of minutes of your hanging someone with nails through his hands, those hands are going to, the nails are going to tear through the hands, and the person's going to fall to the ground. So some say that Jesus was also, also held up by ropes. You know, his wrists were, they say, were tied to the cross, and then the nails were put in, and then the weight of his body was upheld by the ropes. Others say there weren't three nails used, as illustrated in a typical crucifixion painting or statue. They, they say that the torture stake was only one piece of wood. They say there was no horizontal cross piece, and they say that Jesus' arms were above his head, and that both hands had a single nail through both of them. And again, they say ropes probably had to be used to hold up the weight of his body. Okay, 
we can't all agree on what it looked like when Jesus was crucified. But I think we can agree that Jesus was nailed to either a cross or an upright piece of wood. So can our first piece uh, or first point of agreement be that Jesus was nailed to this instrument of torture and death? So that's the first thing that was nailed to the cross, and that's Jesus. Let's get to the second thing that I think we can all agree on that was nailed to the cross. There was a sign that was nailed to the cross. Don't we find this mentioned in all four of the Gospels? And, and here's where, I, I hate to be, you know, all pro-Catholic tonight, because someone's going to say, OS is turning Catholic, and I'm not. But here's where the Catholics actually get it right in their pictures and their statues of their, of their crucifixions. Now, let's interject something. I don't believe in having pictures and statues of the crucifixion. I see no value in this. That's me. You do what you want. But Nancy and I don't have any pictures or statues of the crucifixion in our home. In fact, we don't have any crosses in our home. We just don't do that. So when I show you something, uh, you know, a picture of something on the screen, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm in, in agreement with that picture. Some of you got offended last Friday night when I had a crucifixion picture on the screen. And my thing is, well, we got to talk about this stuff. We got to look at what we're studying. So I'm not going to apologize for putting up a picture of a crucifixion because I think we need this picture for education process. Right now, we have a Catholic picture of the crucifixion on the screen. Now, why do I say it's a typically Catholic crucifixion? Because it's got the letters INRI, I-N-R-I, INRI. Can you, see, can you see them? Protestant crucifixions normally don't have that feature in their crucifixions. And by the way, INRI, I-N-R-I, is a Latin abbreviation for the words Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. It can also mean this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Remember that sometimes we have to translate and sometimes we have to transliterate to get the meaning out of another language. We've talked about this before on previous SOSs. And if you didn't get that show, you can go back and watch it. A translation of Inri is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. A transliteration of Inri is this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And again, these Catholic images of the crucifixion that have Inri on them are actually more important than the Protestant images of the crucifixion because the Protestant versions usually leave out the sign that says Inri on it. All right. Back to the gospel accounts of the sign that was nailed to the cross. Matthew 27, 37, please write that down. Matthew 27, 37, it says, Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. You can see it right here. Matthew, uh, Mark 15, 26, the written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. Luke 23, 38, it says there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. John 19, 19 records, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So I've got all of them up here. Now, there's been a lot of debate over the centuries about why these four accounts have differences in the wording. And I've heard all kinds of theories. I mean, just bunches of them. And we don't have time to go into all of them. And frankly, I don't put much credence into most of them. I think we can understand the seeming problem of inconsistency that we have. And again, I use the word seeming. We can understand it by simply reading John 19.20, which tells us, write this down, John 19.20, many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So it doesn't take much to figure out that you've got a sign and it's got three different translations on the sign. And each language said something a little bit differently than the others. Now, is that a stretch? Am I oversimplifying? If you think so, talk to me in the chat room if you disagree. But our main point is this. The second thing that was nailed to the cross was a sign. And I hope that we can agree on that point. Now let's get to the third thing that was nailed to the cross. And here's where it gets controversial because we're getting back to where we started which, with, with the contradictory translations of Colossians 2.14. 
Let's go into this in some detail. Because it's clear in this passage, Colossians 2.14, that something was nailed to the cross that was not either Jesus, and it was not a sign that said, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. So there's clearly a third thing, and I believe that most agree that this thing, this third thing that was nailed to the cross was not literal, but it was figuratively. Question, do we have anything in the gospel accounts that say that someone came along during Jesus' crucifixion and nailed a copy of the Ten Commandments to the cross? Do we have anything in the gospel accounts that say that someone came along during Jesus' crucifixion and nailed anything to the cross, like a parchment or a tablet or a piece of paper, anything other than our sign, which said Jesus, King of the Jews. Absolutely not. There's nothing there in the gospel accounts about this. So whatever this third thing was that was nailed to the cross, it was figurative, where Jesus and the sign were literal. They were literally nailed to the cross. Are you still with me? Am I making sense? So what Paul is talking about in Colossians 2.14, when he, when, he, when, he, when he tells us that a third thing was nailed to the cross, what, what was he talking about? Well, let's ask another question. And please think very carefully before you answer this. Did Paul say in Colossians 2.14 that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross? No. Absolutely not. Now, how can we be so dogmatic when we say that Paul is not saying that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross? Well, because if Paul were to say that the Ten Commandments had been nailed to the cross, he would have had to use the Greek word nomos, N-O-M-O-S. Now, some of you who, who didn't watch last week's show, you're saying, what in the world is he talking about nomos? For those of you who did watch the show last week, you remember our discussion last Friday night that the New Testament writers used the word nomos when talking about the law. And Now, if you missed last week's show, and if you want to know what we're talking about when we say nomos, go back and watch SOS 65. Don't do it now, but after this show or tomorrow, the YouTube link is on dynamicchristianministries.org dynamicchristianministries.org and watch SOS 65 and learn about nomos. Okay, again, if Paul were going to say that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross, he would have had to use the word nomos because that's the Greek word that they used when they talked about the law. And the Greek word nomos is not found anywhere in the entirety of chapter 2 of Colossians. So what Paul is saying He's saying that what got nailed to the cross were the handwriting of ordinances. It's, uh, that's what most translations have, or they'll say the handwriting of decrees. Now let's look at the three Greek words that Paul used that got translated into handwriting of ordinances or handwriting of decrees. These three words, they're in yellow. Choreographon, which means handwriting. Toas which means in the, and dogmasin, which means decrees or ordinances. Again, do you see the word nomos here? No, you don't. So then what's Paul talking about when he uses this phrase, karyographon, toes, dogmasin? And let's insert a really important point here. Because at this point, it's right now, where some antinomian, and what's an antinomian? Well, we talked about that last week. Someone who's against the nomos. Someone who's against the law. Again, last week, SOS 65. Go back, watch it. It's at this point in our conversation we're having tonight where some antinomian is going to bring up Galatians 3.13 where it says, we are under the curse of the law. And get this. That statement is absolutely true. We are under the curse of the law. And someone says, what a horrible thing to say. But it's true. Remember, the law does not save us. The law can never save us. The only thing that can save us is the blood of Jesus. Well, then, what's the purpose of the law? Well, it's simple. The law identifies sin, which we commit every day. The law tells us, you want to know what sin is? Look at the law, and you'll see exactly what sin is. Because what is sin? 1 John 3, 4, write that down. 1 John 3, 4 clearly tells us that sin is the transgression of the law, the nomos. So we look to the law. We look to the nomos 
to see where we come up short, to see where we miss the mark, to see what our sins are, because that happens to us every day. We sin. Again, the law can't save us. The law can only convict us. And when we are con convicted of sin, because the law shows us where we come up short, at that point where we're convicted of sin, at that point we're under the curse of the law. But then we repent. We ask God for forgiveness. And through the blood of Jesus, we receive that forgiveness. All right, back to Karyographon Tois Dogmason. In Colossians 2.14, Paul is saying that the handwriting of ordinances against us, that sentence of death that was once upon us, was nailed to the cross. And that's our third thing that was nailed to the cross. Again, not literally, but figuratively. Again, the handwriting of ordinances against us is not the Ten Commandments. Nowhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament is there some formula that tells us that a definition of the Ten Commandments is some handwriting of ordinance or handwriting of decrees against us. And that's because the Ten Commandments are not synonymous with choreographon, toes, dogmason, the handwriting of ordinances or decrees against us. The Ten Commandments are one thing. The handwriting of ordinances are another thing. They are not synonymous. In other words, the handwriting of no, uh, ordinances is our note of guilt. It's a list of our sins. It's all the evil that we have committed. It's the certificate of our debt that's caused because of our carnality and our sin. But once a person accepts Jesus as his Savior, and agrees to follow Jesus' example in his daily life, that note of guilt, that summary of sins, that certificate of debt, debt, it's nailed to the cross, and it's gone completely. Isn't that beautiful? Gone completely. Once you accept Jesus, it does not nullify God's holy law called the Ten Commandments. God's law is wonderful. It's eternal. So your acceptance of Jesus does not negate the value of the law. No. Once you accept Jesus, you're forgiven of all the horrible things that you've done. You're forgiven of the transgression of God's law. Again, I de define God's law. Define sin. Define transgression. 1 John 3, 4. And Psalms 103, 12, write that down. Because a lot of people, don't, some of you out there forget Psalm 103, 12, and you're constantly beating yourself up over some past sin that you committed 40 years ago, and you're holding against yourself, and you got to stop it. Because Psalm 103, 12 tells us that at the point that you repent and accept Jesus, your sins, your transgressions of God's law, your sins become, now get this, as far from God as east is from the West. Psalm 103, 12. Some of you need to write that down and tape it to your bathroom mirror so you see it every morning when you brush your teeth because you're forgetting this. As far as East is from the West, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. East and West cannot touch. Your sins are so far removed from you and from God that they're totally out of his sight. It's as though they never existed. So I have to ask, why are you still beating yourself up over something that you did 10 months ago, 10 weeks ago, 10 days ago, 10 years ago? Why are you still beating yourself up? The beauty of Colossians 2.14 is that this has been removed from you as far as east is from the west. They can no longer meet. That's the beauty of Colossians 2.14. There's no ugliness in Colossians 2.14 that does away with God's wonderful Ten Commandments that we should love. The apostles never preached doing away with the nomos. If they did, they would be antinomian. But quite the opposite, the apostles kept the law. All right, let's end this. I want to close by reading a couple things that were sent to me by Steve Todd and Peter Kamen. But first, uh, before I do that, I want to read, uh, uh, talk about, uh, no, we're, we're, no let, let me save this for next time. I want to talk about adoption as mentioned in Romans 8.15 because that, that is so tied in with what we're doing 
uh, on this Colossians and Galatians thing. We're going to talk about adoption as mentioned in Romans 8.15 because when the world sees that word adoption, they get it all wrong because adoption is a really, really bad translation. So we'll do that in two weeks. Uh, but first I want to read something sent to us by Steve Todd and Peter Kamen. Um, and remember, in one week, uh, we're going to have guests. It's going to be Jeff uh, Reed, who's going to be here from uh, CGI. He's going to be here in the studio. We're also going to have Kelly McDonald, who's going to be here from the Bible Sabbath Association. And Bill will be here, too, only he'll be here electronically. All right. So don't be, make sure you come back uh, next week and in two weeks. All right. Let me close with two things I want to read from something from our viewers. Last week, I read a short paragraph from my friend Steve Todd, who lives out uh, west of Fort Worth. And I told you that after we went through tonight's segment, I want to read it again because I think it'll make more sense after we've examined Colossians 2.14. Let's hear what Steve wrote one more time. Steve writes, he says, Here is a verse many like to use to prove that the law was changed in the New Testament. Hebrews 7.12. Let's read that. Write that down. Hebrews 7.12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Steve says the word changed here is Strong's number 3346, and it simply means to transfer. The Levitical priesthood was transferred to the Melchizedek priesthood. And Steve says, as a re result, the law was transferred to a new administration. The law was no longer being administered under the Levitical priesthood. He says, with the death and resurrection of Yeshua, or Jesus, and his permanent sacrifice for our sins, he says, Yeshua is now the perfect priest after the order of Melchizedek. He says, as a result, the law was transferred to a new administration under the direction of Yeshua, or Jesus, end quote. Again, Hebrews 7.12 says nothing about doing away with God's law. As Steve points out, it says here there is a transference of the administration of God's law. And I look at that and I say that's a beautiful, beautiful concept. We keep the law, but we no longer recognize that the Levitical priesthood is administering it. Instead, it goes to that, the priesthood that existed long, long before the Levitical priesthood that we find in the book of Gen Genesis, the Melchizedek priesthood. All right, that's from Steve. Now, let's read something quickly from Peter Kamen. Peter writes, and I'm quoting. It is, uh, you get your stuff ready, because uh, after this, we're going to let you talk, okay? It is, uh, well, we're going to let other people talk through you. Are you ready to be channeler? So, okay. Peter Kamen, quote, it is often argued among those of the antinomian viewpoint that they are fine with nine of the Ten Commandments, but that the Seventh-day Sabbath stands alone as an added law, which is part of the law of Moses. Peter says they look at the Sabbath commandment as an addendum of sorts to the other nine commandments. He's still quoting Peter. He says, before the new creation, the Sabbath as defined may not have existed. We're talking about the creation in Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. But Peter, Peter says, but with the introduction of man during the creation week and God's intended destiny for man, there became a need for a way in which God could communicate his plan of salvation for man, which includes a final rest. And he says this is found in Hebrews 4. Isn't this beautiful? Peter says then in Mark 2.27, he says, we see where Jesus revealed that, excuse me, Jesus revealed in Mark 2, 27, that the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. End quote from Peter. Peter makes a really good point that the seventh-day Sabbath can never be some kind of addendum to the law that was given to us by Moses, as some antinomians would have us believe, because God very clearly showed that the seventh-day Sabbath was created in the same week that man was created. Mark 2.27 clearly shows the linkage between these two creations, man and the seventh-day Sabbath. Thank you, Peter. That's wonderful. And thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, two really good things. And that's why we're so glad when uh, you people write in because you really got good stuff. Again, next Friday, 
Bill's going to be here electronically. Jeff Reed is going to be live in the studio. Kelly McDonald is going to be live in the studio. The following Friday evening, two weeks from tonight, hopefully we can talk more about misperceptions of Galatians and Colossians and that very poorly chosen word, poorly chosen by the translators, adoption. the adoption that's mentioned in Romans and Ephesians. And remember that all this stuff that we're looking at all ties in with misperceptions about the books of Colossians and Ephesians. So let's try to talk about that uh, in the next two weeks. Over the next two weeks, feel free to write me at um, wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. That's my email address, okay. wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. Nancy, what do you got for us tonight? Okay, uh, we have Kevin O'Hare with us, Jean Tarter, Marita Reese, Willow Love Al says, Happy Sabbath from South Carolina. Jeffrey Flum says, Hello from Northwest Chicago land. Brenda Patterson from Irving, Texas. David Lind, Grover Proctor says, Happy Sabbath. Horst Overmite from Keenly, North Carolina. Hey, Horst, I saw you on Facebook and YouTube. Are you double dipping? <laughs> he's, he's schizophrenic. He has two personalities. <laughs> Yeah, Peter Kamen said he's here in spite of a tornado in the New York uh, City area. Really? Or tornado in New York? Uh, uh, new, near New York City. Near, oh, really? It was. Oh, we're uh, so Richard Maxwell. Well, wait, let's pray about that, okay? Will you all put that on your prayer list, tornadoes in New York, as well as the wildfires at uh, Mimi? In uh, California. In California and, 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 and British Columbia. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Please pray uh, about that. Richard Maxwell from Rocky Ridge, Maryland. Richard Mendez, Reed Harding Bradwell, Larry, Larry Evans, John Black. Rob Petty, uh, David Lacey, Ariel Melkor, Betsy Gross. A Ariel Bethlehem. Melkor. Hello, Pastor. Uh, Beth Lane Meath. Bill Bratt said it feels like it would be good to, to translate Ron's stuff. And Diane Webb, who joins us from Avenger, said she'll take the Swahili version. <laughs> That's back to right. With there her. we go. Very good, Diane. Uh, Trish Harley's with us. <laughs> Amy Hohert said whenever she hears nomos, she wants to say... Uh, don't you come back, no mo, no, no mo, no, no mo, no. <laughs> hit the road, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Jean King from Georgia. Melissa James says we overuse the word love as well. Oh, uh, let, let me mention that. Uh, I saw that uh, earlier, and she's right because we say things like, "Oh, I love chips and dip," mm -hmm. and you know, I uh, I love my new computer or my new telephone or something. And we hit the love button on Facebook all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and so I think she's right that love is overused because love is, and there are three types of love mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's eros, which is romantic love, Philadelphia love, which is brotherly love, and agape, which is um, spiritual love. And, and so, so is it uh, brotherly love when you love your tacos? or? I don't know what kind of love that? that is. Maybe it's eros love. I don't know, <laughs> but maybe that's something we ought to talk about sometime is the three different types of uh, love that are mentioned in the New Testament. Excellent idea. Okay, good, I good point, uh, Melissa James. Thank you. Okay, so regarding my section, Rod Kuzman says praising God should be a significant part of our litur liturgy. Absolutely, yes. Say that again. Praising God should be... A part of our liturgy and and you know if you're a going significant part significant part if you go to church and they're singing a bunch of crummy old hymns sing them you know sing out and enjoy it and 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 if everybody around you is snoozing their way through it and the song leader doesn't really care he's only going through the motions you praise god through music anyway in spite of all these people and if, if people look at you like you're crazy say too bad and i'm not saying you know, get all speaking in tongues in church. No, no, I'm not saying I'm saying sing out in church, even if it's a song you don't like, sing it anyway. Okay. Praise God. It's got to be an important part of our liturgy. Okay. I think that that's a great point. Um, you want to change that to the next one? What is it? Uh, just ch that, there you go. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, <laughs> Bill's section, read. Uh, Richard Maxwell says the SDA groups uh, were growing faster outside of the U.S. and inside. And I think that's true of some other, I think CG7 might be the same. Yeah, but CG7 is growing tremendously within the United okay. States in the Hispanic uh, people, Spanish-speaking people. Because um, in um, uh, Dallas alone, they must have like five or seven, I think it's now seven uh, uh, churches of God, Seventh Day, and all but one is, is, is Spanish-speaking. So... Um, just, just, that's a statistical fact. Uh, Larry Evans says, in the early days of um, Radio Church of God, uh, Worldwide Church of God, uh, festival attendance did increase 30% for a time. Okay. Okay, so Wes, um, let's see. 
Richard Maxwell um, says we should let the Bible interpret itself. Yes, the Bible should interpret the Bible. Yes. Uh, and we try to do that. And we try to keep our biases out of it, mm -hmm. you know. But you know, and I understand. I'm carnal. I'm human. I'm not perfect. I see through a glass darkly. And so, uh, my Rorschach uh, test. Sometimes I might not get it right about the Bible. I understand that. But we got to do the best we can. But as as what was that Maxwell Richard Maxwell mm -hmm. says, you got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. That's yes. Right. Doko Mafahi says uh, we disagree because. We think our church is better than okay. others. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, That's typical, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, David Lacey says, yes, there is some bias in different interpretations. The King James, the chief editor, was a strong Calvinist. I'm paraphrasing. And um, uh, thinks the best one now is uh, Tyndale's, best English transaction. Translation, and he wants to know what translation you use. I use my King James. I love my King James, but I'm the first to admit that King James has got errors just like all of them. And uh, the, the most glaring errors, let me give you a couple examples Acts 12, 4, mm -hmm. um, and uh, 1 uh, Corinthians 5, 7. That's a out and out insertion that isn't, isn't in any other translation. Even mm -hmm. the Catholics don't have. The insertion that the King James put in there, and right, the Calvinists had a real bias, and the Anglicans also worked with the Calvinists to translate the King James. And there's some stuff in there shouldn't be, but still my favorite. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why. Maybe someday I'll change. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see. David Lacey said um, Colossians 2:14 uses the word ordinances, which is the Greek 1378. Uh -huh. um, one that which is supposed to supposed as good or which seems right whether it actually is or not two concisely an opinion on a matter three by conclusion a degree or ordinance civil ceremonial uh, uh, ecclesiastical so that's just some greater interpretation yeah of the thank word you that's right good in there. other words it's not nomos it's not the ten commandments right. it's not the law okay? okay good thank you uh Bill Brad says, uh, excellent presentation on what was nailed to the cross. What is the chances of getting a transcription of this? So write him, remind him well, you want it. Well, all right. You know, all the stuff we do is, trans is uh, scripted. Uh -huh. And everything I present is scripted. And I try to read it in a good way so that you don't know I'm reading. And I get off script. But we're thinking about taking all of our scripts from uh, SOS and putting them in some kind of a, a, of a PDF and putting them out there for people to be able to read. And it really wouldn't be that difficult. So, so anyway, to answer your question, we're not only that, but we're thinking of other things. So what, what are, what are, if you guys have any thoughts on that, let us know. Okay. David Lacey says Hebrews 7.11 reassigns the legislation of Torah and dismisses the former Levitical priesthood. Yes. Very good. Very good. Thank you. And Bill, multiple times you're here, reminds you to share. Hit the share button. Uh, Larry Evans says some work the way around the Sabbath by saying Jesus is our rest. Therefore, we do not have to uh, rest on the seventh day. That's right. Uh, Benita Miller joined us. The word is Sabbatismo. Yeah. Says, Hi, everybody. Brian Renard says, Happy Sabbath. Le uh, Leandro Bra uh, Branzon Jr. is watching. And um, Thoko Mafah, he says, Excellent presentation. Thanks. Beautiful Sabbath to us. Thank you. Uh, Sajeev, Sajeev is watching from India. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Nice to have you. Yeah. Welcome. But it's hotter there than it is here. Yeah, who knows? And Richard Mendez says, The PDF would be great. So okay. that, that's it for Facebook. That's what I'm reading for right now. On YouTube, we have uh, Birgit with us. Of course, Mimi's here. Hey, Birgit. Uh, Mimi. Super Jim complained about the volume, but he seemed to be having trouble just on his end. We haven't seen Super Jim in a while, Not have in we? A while, no. Welcome back, Jim. We missed you. See, we pay attention to who's here. We, we got a little roll call sheet. No, we don't. Uh, so let's see. Super Jim says David, uh, King David, was not big like Saul, but had God's power working for him. I'm not sure what that was connected to. Yeah, well, uh, Bill talked about uh, David in the census. Oh, that's right. Not, he did. He, yeah. He did. And, and, and he, Super Jim said that. Super yeah. Jim's absolutely right. Remember, Saul was huge. He, he wasn't a giant, but he was head and shoulders above all other men. 
or most other men. And uh, we have no indication that David was big like he was. He might have been a little runt. We don't know. Uh, that's right. But that's a good point, Jim. Yeah, Super Jim. David, David's dad didn't even think he should be a contender for the kingship. Nobody thought he should be. The, his brothers, his dad. Yeah, we got one more scrawny kid out in the pasture. And all he's good for is watching sheep. He's not good for anything else. You don't want him. Samuel said, that's the one I want. Go get him. <laughs> um, positive Dennis says, it is a record of our sins, or if used in a financial sense, it is a mortgage or debt instrument. Yes. Uh, our, our debt is paid. And I think, to me, that's, that's uh, the record of our sin is important, and so is the debt. I think about yeah. the debt. They go away together, but yeah. um, it's more precious to me that the debt, like, <laughs> this is wiped away. And welcome, uh, Positive Dennis. We haven't seen you in a while either, so welcome back to the show. Paul Shaw is with us. Paul Shaw is always with us, and you better be with us, Paul, or I'll come looking for you. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, Paul. Wow. I know Paul. I can say stuff <laughs> like that to him. You heard it here first. If something happens to Paul, you know where to go. <laughs> go, go ask Wes what happened. <laughs> Okay, so um, I, uh, Positive Dennis office also said that the fire was close, but uh, had but to get to my house, it would have had to jump Rocky Ridge. Oh, okay. So, so Dennis is, is pretty much safe. Yeah. Good. Glad um, to hear that. And a friend of his had lost their home, so that's pretty bad. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Hmm. All right, so um, I think that's that's. If for now there was one, or, please do transcription, says Bill Brad. Okay. And again, if you found value in this show, hit the share button. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, cut and paste the uh, link and send it out to your friends. If you, uh, you know, found enough value to sit through an hour of our blithering and blathering, it must have meant something to hey, you. So share it with other people. I didn't blither and blather. Oh, no. What was that? If you weren't blithering and blathering. I was praising. Oh, okay. All right. Then I was blithering and blathering. Nancy wasn't. And I have no idea what Bill was doing. Yeah. So we'll let him characterize. Well, unfortunately, I can't hear Bill when I'm overlooking it. Uh, I can. When I'm watching the... Uh, when I'm running the camera and he's on, when I bring him on board, I can't hear him at all because we have to all turn the sound down so there's no echo. And so I look at his script, but I don't get to hear it. Right. So. Yeah, but I get to. On the replay, though. Yeah, we get it on the replay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, hit the share button because that's share, 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 share is yes. important to us. Yes. And uh, come back next week. You don't yeah, want to miss next show week's show. Next we got week. a big show next week. We'll be full of Mexican food before we get here. Going to eat some good Mexican food. With oh, that's right. We're we going out to eat. Yeah, no pizza or hamburgers. No pizza. We're, we're get, I had pizza before the show tonight. Uh, next Friday uh, at 5 o'clock Central Time, we're all going to head up to Gilmer to this wonderful Mexican restaurant mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. Going to gorge ourselves like pigs on Mexican food. Oh, and come back. But... Well, all right. We're going to enjoy ourselves and um, come back here and do the show. That's right. Yeah. So, so we got we got the guests on, and that's going to be great. And then in two weeks, you're going to talk about adoption and more about the misunderstanding of uh, Ephesians and Colossians. Yes. Okay. And so you don't I want don't to know miss... what I'm talking about yet, but I've got two weeks to figure it out. Yes. And uh, Bill won't be going to eat Mexican food with us. Well, hey, maybe he can have Mexican food in California. I think we ought to get him on um, uh, FaceTime. Oh, while well, we're out eating? Yeah, and let him watch us eat, you know, and say, <laughs> no. say, Bill, boy, you're really missing out on some really good Texas genuine Mexican food, Bill. So, okay. Anything else? Uh, no other comments? We can uh, – Bill just said something about Mexican food. He said, well, I love that Mexican restaurant. Yeah, Bill has been to this, this Mexican restaurant. Really good. What's the name of it? I forgot. Uh, La Finca. La Finca. And we've taken Bill there, and Bill loves it. It's really a good Mexican restaurant mm -hmm. uh, in a small town. So mm -hmm. it's, And it's clean and just really nice. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Anything else? That's it. All right. Shall we close with prayer? Let's do it. Our Father in heaven, once again, we want to praise you and thank you for the opportunity that this uh, small group of the Ecclesia got together to uh, study your word and to fellowship electronically and praise you. And we thank you so much for um, all of the opportunities that you give us. We thank you, Father, for the Internet and for what we can do with it. We're so sorry that mankind uses it for such evil things that it does. This is a wonderful thing that you've given mankind. Help us to use the Internet in good ways to preach about Jesus, to preach about our love for the law, and to uh, talk about the love that we have for each other. 
because without love, we are nothing. We're just clanging bells. So now we ask your blessing on all of those tomorrow who will be uh, heading somewhere to church and to fellowship, uh, you know, face to face. Please give them your safety. Please put your guidance and your direction on all that they do in church. We're so grateful to you for your love and your mercy and your generosity. So once again, we commit our lives to you and give you thanks. We do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you so much. You come back next week. Otherwise, we'll miss you. And one more thing. We'll be sad. Oh, one last thing. Have, Have a, a good Sabbath. Sabbath. And come back next week. That's right. Go Don't to make church us sad. tomorrow if you Don't have make a church us sad. To to. We'll cry. Yeah. And have a good day at church if you can go. If you can go, go.